This part of the course is about the optimal use of the shoulder, which is an incredibly complex joint. And as we all know, it's just really often difficult to get your head around what's happening and understanding what's happening. Uh, you can understand how it should work and then you can understand what's actually going wrong. So the shoulder joint is the most mobile joint in the animal kingdom. And being mobile is wonderful because it allows us to reach and stretch and do all the wonderful things we can do. But it comes at a price because if you have a lot of mobility, what you, what you get shrinking amounts of is stability. So in all joints, you have this wall between mobility and stability. If you have a lot of stability, then you will limit the amount of mobility the joints have which will make it much less, uh, make it harder to injure. So the first step of understanding optimal function is to ask yourself this incredibly basic question, which is, why did God give us a shoulder? Okay, what does the shoulder do? What function does the shoulder perform without which we would all be dead? And which is a question that I, it popped up into my head one day, I've asked a number of doctors and very few actually get the right answer. So, obviously I can't ask you, but just think about that for a second. What function does the shoulder do? And if you don't have that function, you will die. And the answer is, it puts food in your mouth. That's what it does. So, if you think, right, that's the most, that's, basically why whoever created us gave us a shoulder to put food in our mouth. That movement, that plane of movement, is the most fundamental movement and it's the movement the shoulder does best, which is cool. And when you look at the shoulder, you'll see that the glenoid fossa are on this side. So here's a shoulder. The glenoid fossa are angled slightly inwards and the way that the shoulder rotates when it rotates in this plane, nothing gets in the way of anything, which is very cool. And that's why this is the function that is, it's designed for, and this is the function which gets interfered with the least. This plane, reaching above your head, putting food in your mouth. Okay, so if you were to think, okay, this plane is what the shoulder is designed for, which is the movement furthest away from that plane, then it would be that movement. So this movement is the, shoulder, is the movement that the shoulder is least well designed to do. And this is in fact quite true. That what happens is that when you injure your shoulder, the movement that almost invariably causes pain is that movement. Okay, now the question is why? And to understand that, you have to go back to, as always, the anatomy. So if we look at the anatomy of the shoulder, what we have is you have a shoulder blade, and the shoulder blade sits on your thoracic spine like this and the shoulder blade is the base of the shoulder so this base this is the beginning of our problems this base just floats it floats on your thoracic spine moves backwards and forwards it's on a layer of airy, what's called loose areolar tissue, which is just loose, soft tissue, allowing it to glide over the ribs. So, if it's the base of this long, huge lever, which has weights at the end, doing stuff, surely this base should be really firm and solid. But it isn't. What holds the shoulder, what holds the scapula in place, is just a series of muscles. 
So that's a really weird design fault, but that is one of the, those huge um, compromises that our designer made because for the shoulder to be so mobile, its base needs to be mobile. So that's your first fundamental problem is the stabilizers. And so now I'm going to start using a, um, a, a division in the, because the shoulder has got a few bones, but its essence comes in the muscles of the shoulder. And the stabilizers of the scapula have to be really strong. And they have to be strong enough to support all the stuff we do. And in a lot of people, the stabilizers of the scapula are not up to the task. So first group of muscles, scapula stabilizers. And the problem with these are that, firstly, it's the base, which has to be solid. Secondly, some of the stabilizers come from your scapula and attach to the thoracic spine, which is quite a solid base. But some of the scapula, some of the stabilizers arise from here and they run up to your neck. And the problem is that the neck is a wobbly structure. So now what you have is you have the scapula, which is supposed to be this really strong base for this long lever which and some of the bigger stabilizers like your trapezius and your levator scapulae right at the back these are attached to a wobbly structure which is your neck and that creates all manner of problems next if we look so now we're coming back to the um, basic structure of, of, of the shoulder so what you have is you have the scapula and then the scapula has a fossa, which is the glenoid fossa. It is tiny, really small. And there's a big, big, the head of the humerus is many times bigger than the glenoid fossa. Again, the reason is mobility. So the question of, if you look at, if you look at how joints work, if you take a hip, you have an acetabulum, you've got the head of the femur goes in, and as it rotates around in the acetabulum, for it to work well, the center of rotation of the head needs to be pretty close to the center of the cup. And the hip does that because it's a stable structure, and as it moves around, it's actually got a a, a join where all the blood vessels come through to the head of the femur and it twists around well enough so that it doesn't do anything under normal circumstances to its own blood supply. This guy, it has to move a hell of a lot more than your hip and to do that you've got this tiny little cup but for it to work accurately the center of rotation of this big cup of well, this big ball has to move only a few millimeters away from the center of rotation of the glenoid cup. And it needs to do that while the shoulder is actually rotating at thousands of degrees a second. So if you took uh, an extreme movement like throwing, and if you took the extreme of an extreme movement, which is a baseball pitcher who does this amazing thing where they, they throw their whole body back and then they just fling like this. At that time, there's this amazingly fast rotation and yet the head of the humerus is only a few millimeters away from the center of the cup. And the question is, how on earth does this strange wobbly structure manage that and it does it with a fascinating group of muscles which all attach to the scapula so you have the muscles that stabilize the scapula now you have the set of muscles that balance the head 
so that it rotates in the center of the cup. And these are the four muscles of the rotator cuff. So, the spine of the scapula, you have the supraspinatus, you have the, which is above the spine, you have the infraspinatus below the spine, you have the teres minor below that, and you have the inside here, a big muscle called the subscapularis, attaching inside. And all of these then send tendons which run through their respective spaces and wrap around the head of the humerus. And all the tendons that wrap around the head form the rotator cuff. And the job of the cuff is that these four relatively small muscles will be balancing. So they are mobile stabilizers, which is really fascinating. Mobile stabilizers. There's nothing quite like it in the body. And because they're asked to do this incredibly complex job of keeping the head um, in its, you know, doing all these fancy things, they are also incredibly vulnerable to damage. Of the stabilizers of these rotator cuff muscles, there's one muscle in particular, which is the supraspinatus, the muscle that sits above the spine of the scapula. The supraspinatus, which, if you want to point fingers and talk about design faults, the supraspinatus comes near the top. So, the supraspinatus arises from, in this cup, here, and it runs forward, so I'm kind of squinting down the space. It runs forward through this tiny space, and then it runs along the top of the, of the humerus and curls around and attaches on the greater tuberosity here. Okay, now, it's a fascinating muscle because it does something which is unbelievably important in the functioning of the shoulder. When this, if you see how my finger is, my finger is doing what the supraspinatus does. Here it is, coming through. Now, if you remember back to what I said, which is the most, the movement which is most poorly done in the shoulder is lifting your arm out sideways, abduction. If you want to lift the arm out in that direction, what there are two anatomical structures here which pose a difficulty. The first is this, which is the acromion, an extension of the spine of the scapula, which wraps around the outside of your shoulder like this, and it forms a shelf. The second is this bump here, which is the greater tuberosity of the humerus which is where a number of the rotator cuff muscles attach. So if I'm lifting my arm up and it will depend on this movement will work well under certain circumstances and will be a major problem under others. If the head of the humerus is lifted up, then as I lift my arm out, this will dig into there and it will impinge. So this is a very, very common problem. If the head of the humerus drops down and I lift, I have all the space in the world. So depending on how that head moves will depend on how well this particular movement, which is the worst movement, will occur. There is one muscle which is the supraspinatus, which its primary job is to make this movement good. <laughs> and so, the way it works is like this. Here's your supraspinatus. It's running through this little space. It's running over the top and it's attaching to the tuberosity. If the supraspinatus contracts, it will 
pull the head down and what my what my uh, um, little model won't show, it will actually pull it in. So basically it pulls the head down and in against the, the, the glenoid fossa, dropping it and stabilizing it against the fossa. You have a second muscle, which is the deltoid, which comes over. And the deltoid will then lift and the movement will be effortless and painless. So for this difficult movement to occur, supraspinatus has to fire first. It fires, pulls everything down and in. Then, secondly, the deltoid fires and it pulls the arm up. Again, just to take a step back, the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus and the rotator cuff muscles are stabilizers, mobile stabilizers, the rest of the muscles of the shoulder are power muscles and they are mobilizers. The deltoid is a large mobilizer of the shoulder. So if the delt now, so if we take that the supraspinatus works, it pulls the head down, pulls it in, and you get abduction painlessly. If however the supraspinatus is damaged, so and uh, or is slow to fire because of strange movements that people do, then what will happen is the first movement when the deltoid contracts will be to pull the head up because that's what the deltoid does. It attaches to the rim here, joins down there. It will lift the shoulder up, which will then come up and impinge. So the type of firing, the rate of firing, and the ability of the supraspinatus to come in first is key to this movement. Now, when you look at the anatomy, the supraspinatus runs through the valley of death. This is a very uh, strange and difficult anatomical area because this is the area where the shoulder is moving backwards and forwards and up and down and all over the place with this poor tendon running through this very narrow space and because of this design when you look at rotator cuff problems 90 percent of the time the one that's injured is the supraspinatus it is by far the commonest muscle to be injured Sorry, when I say muscle, I mean muscle and tendon, because it's usually the tendon which is sliding through this area, the subacromial space, and therefore, if once the supraspinatus becomes damaged, then as a consequence of that, you will almost invariably get impingement, which will then damage the sac that sits over this area, the bursa, this will become inflamed and you end up with the commonest picture which is supraspinatus tendinopathy, damage to the supraspinatus tendon, the overlying bursa is, is inflamed, the function of the shoulder is no longer normal and you get impingement and ongoing damage to the supraspinatus tendon and bursa every time it comes up. So this is the commonest presentation that moves you away from optimal function of the shoulder.